Good morning. Um, welcome again at the Faculty of Architecture at University of Belgrade. Uh, today is the second day of our seminar entitled Belgrade Mass Housing Apartment and Far Beyond. We continue with uh, our work from the previous day. And uh, at the very beginning, I will uh, read you a short um uh, short text i prepared as the uh what professor lianitsa said yesterday is a kind of teaser for our participants uh and then we shall um have uh three sessions today um in a row and finally the uh uh keynote second keynote lecture um Without further ado, I would like to uh, thank you again for coming here, for getting up this early this morning, and let's let's start. Uh, the notion of Belgrade scheme of apartment and related Belgrade School of Housing dates back to 1975 and the special issue of the magazine Architectura Urbanism number 74 to 77. Prominent architects, engineering engineers and theoreticians of the time strive to envisage and direct the future practice by presenting and evaluating the results of the prolific professional engagement of this field in this field during the previous decade. Professor Lianica yesterday also noted that this particular volume was um, very influ influential, very important point of reference for many years in our um, um, teaching experience at this school. And this uh, specific phenomenon, sorry, the specificities of this phenomenon and conditions of its emergence attracted attention of scholars and practitioners ever since. And while the re reasons for and the arguments for distinguishing it within the broader context of housing production in socialist Yugoslavia might be still vague, it is undisputable that in its peak at the beginning of 1970s, the architectural discourse related to this topic was especially vibrant and productive in this part of the world. And as we all know now, coincided with similar practices throughout Europe. Taking this historical notion as the point of departure, the contributors to the seminar are invited to explore both the key questions and the margins of our, our common field of work, European middle class mass housing since 1950s. In other words, it is exposed as a kind of temporary anchor that can allow us to tackle the borderlines of the subject and once again, check the basis premises of this particular scientific endeavor. Through this provisional thematic framework, we call for various points of view in attempt to test the limits of this complex and multifaceted theme. It poses the questions, in what terms are the particular MCMH cases representative for diverse cultural contexts and why? What are the cases that are not considered representative, but are particularly insightful from the historical and contemporary perspective? What are the most novel, reliable, or productive methods of research, analysis, or dissemination? And what are the alternative ones? Finally, how do, do we respond to emerging new problems of mass housing and mass migrations? in profoundly changing socio-political conditions of contemporary world and Europe. And I will start this first session. It is centered on MCMH in Serbia. Uh, at the very beginning, I will spare you of my uh, extensive uh, lecture and uh, presenta presentation of my previous work, since our next speakers will speak very much in detail about 
different topics from different perspectives. The beginning, at the beginning, I would like to just to invite you uh, to take a look at the film, the short video that I have prepared two years ago um, within this um, our within our cost action. It uh, is entitled Central Committee Kamera Schwenk. Uh, I prepare it with my um, colleague and friend, uh, Maria Zurnic. She is uh, an expert in political sciences. The video emerged during the most difficult days of pandemic. We were um, recording uh, short videos in the sites you have the opportunity to see yesterday. So that is the reason I would like to invite you to watch this movie. It is on our MCMH site, website. I think you will see it with different eyes and uh, uh, it will somehow give you some new um, meanings to what you have, what we all have seen yesterday. It is about the relationship of the politics, of the political um, setup, political and economic uh, conditions in which uh, those um, settlements we have visited yesterday emerged. And on this slide, you can see on the left side, the building, the original, um, uh, um, uh, the building on the Central Committee of the Communist Party, uh, Com Communist Party of Yugoslavia, um, and in the in the back, you can see the Block Twenty One we have visited right after our um, our uh, work at the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. So I'm showing you this photograph just to make this link to the previous day to invite you all to take a look at this uh, film. It was um, condensed, it is condensed. It is hard to understand uh, without some kind of previous um, knowledge. But um, I think now on, now you will be able to recognize the Museum of Contemporary Art on this, uh, uh, on this slide on the, de on the right side. It was filmed from this building, from the ninth floor during the pandemic, when the old space was empty since uh, uh, the employers were uh, working from their home. So it catches one specific moment. And uh, at the end of the film, I would invite you to take a look in this uh, empty space. Uh, at that moment, one of the one part of the building was re uh, in the process of reconstruction and renovation, and uh, somehow I uh, saw this uh, moment as a, also as a kind of question mark, like Professor Loyanitsa have showed yesterday, as kind of invitation to think about new ways to connect political thought political setup, political ideas with architectural engagement in, um, in thinking, building and um, living in uh, this type of uh, uh, dwelling and this type of um, uh, mass housing. Uh, so I will end now with this uh, introduction and uh, invite my colleagues to take take the floor. Uh, so uh, the first presenter today is Dalia Dukanec, PhD candidate for univer from U University of Belgrade, uh, and she will provide the broader insights regarding the selected cases case studies from Serbia. Um, after that, Angel Kabadnir. PhD candidate from University of Aachen, will focus on the topic of mass housing technology and knowledge transfer. Angelka was not able to come today, uh, but she will uh, present her work online 
So we will have uh, the second presentation will be um, uh, um, thanks to our uh, super operators that are uh, recording and uh, um, following all our events today. We will uh, be able to um, hear Angelka from uh, from Germany. And uh, then Dra Dragan Vichorovic and Nevena Vasiljevic, our members from COS group, from uh, the, uh, the Department of Landscape Architecture of the Faculty of Forestry, together with Sandra Mitrovic, PhD candidate, will extend conversation towards the large scales and urban landscape. Finally, in this session, the team from Novi Sad, Milena Krkljiš and Dana Neducin will discuss the case studies from the northern part of Serbia and their approach to our theme. So please, Dalia, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dalia Dukanac, as Maria introduced me, uh, coming from the University of Belgrade, and I will just give you a general insight into the case studies that were selected by our team from the University of Belgrade to represent Serbia within this uh, project. So uh, we have chosen four case studies, two are coming from Belgrade. Uh, one is coming from uh, Bor. Uh, this is a city in eastern uh, Serbia. It is a mining town. Um, it is a very interesting town that has developed um, uh, mainly um, in the post-war years, but also had, has a very rich um, urban heritage from pre-war years because it was developed by, um, uh, by uh, uh, French companies that were mining uh, mainly copper and other non-ferrous materials uh, from this um, town. And then the fourth case study is from the town of Subotica, which is located in um, complete northern uh, Serbia, and it has a rich Austro-Hungarian um, urban heritage um, and then resembles um, um, uh, Central European cities much more than other uh, case studies. So the presentation will... <clears throat> is actually um, composed out of these um, four slides uh, always um, um, uh, together so you can um, um, make some comparison between them and i will always show them uh, uh, together uh, so we can try uh, and um, use uh, some of the data that was provided in vg1 template and so on to make them comparable and uh, try to grasp them as 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 a um, as a unity coming from uh, serbia um, so on the first slide, you can see block 23, which is in New Belgrade, uh, which, as I understood, you visited yesterday. So it will be more relatable, perhaps, than other case studies. The second one is uh, Cerak Vineyards, which is um, <clears throat> perhaps the, uh, the largest uh, uh, housing estate um, regarding the, the, the surface that uh, it occupies. Um, and then you have the fourth local community, um, and uh, then the neighborhood that is called Prozivka, which means roll call. Um, and it is actually uh, one uh, case study that has never been finished. The construction stopped during the 90s, but the plan was never realized as, um, as it was uh, designed in the first place during the 70s. So all of these images show the, the construction process of these housing and states, uh, and the idea is to show the scale, so the mass housing uh, uh, indicator in all of these case studies, and to actually see uh, how this um, um, construction industry followed the, the need to provide so many housing um, units and, and uh, to, for um, uh, residents uh, that were um, incoming uh, to cities um, uh, following the post-war years and the internal migration 
migrations of the residents from rural to uh, urban uh, areas. So maybe Elitza Ivanovic, who is speaking later, will tell you more about this uh, topic because she's far more uh, knowledgeable in this um, area. So this is um, the basic uh, data uh, that um, was provided for a VGY1 template. And you can see that um, the first, the third, and the fourth case studies more or less um, uh, occupies the same surface. Uh, but the second one, uh, Tzerak Vineyards, actually occupies a far larger, uh, almost double uh, surface because it, it, it actually uh, encompasses a large surface of recreational and green uh, areas. <clears throat> Uh, in the first case, case study, what is different is a very um, small number of buildings uh, opposed to the uh, other three case studies, uh, but uh, it also um, uh, uh, is a consequence of the uh, general urban um, context that it was uh, built in, which we will see in the next slide. Um, these are all except for the fourth one, archive photos of the, of the um, uh, estates um, when they were built. Uh, and together, although we don't have the precise data for the third one, um, uh, they provided around 13 to 14,000 uh, dwelling units uh, for residents. Um, so we see that only these four case studies provided so many more uh, units for residents uh, during these years, during 70s, they were all built around the same time, planned and built. Uh, so these were um, the sort of golden years for housing construction in Yugoslavia. It was a consequence of uh, socially directed construction uh, policy that was introduced uh, in order to provide such a lar large number of uh, dwelling units, uh, opposed to the previous policy that followed immediately after the post-war years, uh, which actually um, implied um, a construction done by um, specific um, companies, uh, enterprises that would provide housing for their employees. After a while, so this, uh, this policy was also deemed unsustainable and then uh, towards the mid 80s after several economic crises and then um, uh, political insecurities and so on, uh, this model was also abandoned, but it did provide a large number of housing units. So this is uh, more or less the current state of, of these uh, districts. Um, it, all of the photos were taken in recent years. Um, so you can see that they are, um, although they have been built as mass housing, they were all built as open blocks. Um, they all provided uh, this central um, area for um, community life, uh, which still goes on today. It is very much successful in this regard. Um, and um, you can still uh, see, well, actually it is perhaps more successful today than it was previously when it was built, because it did take a couple of decades for people to get used to this new model of housing and so on, especially people who were coming from rural areas. Uh, so only new generations now actually do um, feel these neighborhoods as their own and as uh, having a, um, a part in the community life. <clears throat> you can also see, if you do see, uh, the authors of all of the four uh, case studies. So this is um, not uh, all in the same scale, <laughs> but it should represent uh, uh, the position of these um, housing estates in their immediate urban surroundings. So as I mentioned, we can see uh, in the new Belgrade, which is the first case study block 23, uh, it was planned as a completely new city. Uh, modernist socialist values were um, uh, used to in urban planning uh, and all of the blocks were um, uh, planned together. So the um, uh, urban design constraints uh, were pretty uh, strict when it came to architectural design, actually. Um, but that's why we have such a low number of uh, buildings uh, co uh, compared to other case studies, uh, because the concept of designing uh, urban-wise, uh, this block was completely different to other three case studies. Uh, the second case study, the Serac Vineyards, um, actually, um, you can see on, um, um, northward 
of the estate. You can see the individual houses, single family housing being built, uh, some spontaneously, informally, some formally, and so on. And then on the south, you can see another planned housing estate that was built approximately at the same time. Um, uh, and uh, this is on the fringe of the city, so it is a different uh, kind of concept. Um, and in, it introduced um, um, new typologies and new um, urban matrices, um, which were allowed uh, for architects to actually design because the urban requirements weren't so strict as they were in the, uh, in the first case study. Uh, the, third, the third case study uh, from Bo, uh, you can see um, this state um, like a complete alien body within the urban matrix. Um, uh, since um, uh, this, um, this urban area was um, um, built in a very specific way, I, I, will, I will explain more uh, in the next slide. Uh, Bo has a very interesting uh, urban heritage. Um, and then the fourth one, which is again not uh, not finished, you can see uh, that this large estate was kind of uh, implemented into the matrix that was a completely different scale um, uh, inherited from the Austro-Hungarian um, urban um, development. So here you can see the first two uh, case uh, studies, the first two maps are uh, the same scale, and you can see, uh, so this is this is the city center, the old city center, and then the new Belgrade was built as a new city center. And so this is block 23, and this is Tzerak Vineyards. You can see how far it is actually from the city center and how differently the logic of developing the, the estate uh, was actually applied. Um, and these maps are uh, the same scale. Uh, these two maps are also the same scale, but these towns are far smaller than Belgrade, so it was um, hard to actually um, uh, uh, demonstrate this. Um, and uh, here you can see that Bor city was developed this is the open cast mine of uh, copper and other non-ferrous materials and so uh, metals sorry um, and so the city developed southwards via seven city kilometers so it is um predominantly linear city though it's not completely um, and so the city center was previously located on the first kilometer or the second kilometer which were developed first starting from the open cast mine and then as it developed southwards via these seven city kilometers these uh, this uh, housing estate was built um, during the 70s to provide more housing but at the sa same time a new city center was built uh, on the fifth kilometer so it was supposed to be um, 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 a whole urban area designed together, which it actually does function like that uh, uh, today. Um, and then you can see, as I said, a completely different urban matrix here, because Subatica is far up north, and it is much more flat city than any than Belgrade and Bor, which are um, uh, very much um, dependent on the topography of the of the cities and then this uh, large estate that was implemented uh, into the matrix again on the city fringe so this is finally the same scale for all four case studies where you can see the actual districts um, and uh, and uh, the typology of the buildings that were that were applied um, um, again um, everything that uh, that i explained on the previous slide perhaps it is more visible here uh, regarding the immediate um, uh, urban surroundings um, and what is interesting that all of these uh, urban uh, districts did actually uh, include a large uh, percentage of green areas and recreational areas in their design. So these are um, the typology of the buildings that were applied in each case study. Um, and you can see again the block 23, how a much uh, larger scale uh, the, the actual buildings are and then you can see the other uh, the others had um, uh, more freedom in designing the actual typologies uh, all four case studies uh, do have um, the typology of tower where, whether this is mid-rise or high-rise tower and then we have slabs two corridor slabs within your courtyards or they are more compact or more uh, fragmented and so on um, and so this was again um, 
uh, in the case of, of um, uh, forest local community and in the case of Zerak vineyards, uh, very much in, um, in regard, designed in regard to the topography of the location and the surrounding greenery and so on. So here, we don't have the necessary data to redraw uh, the fourth case study, unfortunately, and uh, I hope we will soon uh, because the archive material wasn't available. Uh, but in these three cases, uh, we can see the, um, uh, the structure of these building typologies. Um, and later on, we can see the typical floor apartments and so on. Uh, but here you can actually see that uh, the, the, the current trend or the intention of all these different architects was to defragment these uh, typologies as much as possible uh, to try and to um, have different ambiances within the apartments, within the buildings, and uh, particularly in the case of Cerak, to try and erase this border between inner and outer space. And so a lot of these uh, 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 small um, uh, terraces and gardens uh, were, were designed. Um, and a lot of uh, sorry, uh, a lot of passages and different uh, uh, and different uh, urban ambiences were uh, were designed within the within the estate. And so the, this kind of detailing and uh, uh, attention to um, uh, to um, um, emerging this um, um, this um, new kind of uh, uh, housing construction uh, in accordance to the socially directed uh, housing uh, construction um, uh, although the constraints were high regarding the surfaces of the apartments, uh, the required uh, number of units and so on, the architects always tried to uh, provide um, the appearance of higher standard uh, housing. Uh, so they would apply um, uh, materials such as uh, facade brick, um, they would apply a large number of prefabricated concrete elements, uh, they were combined with uh, um, uh, cast uh, concrete uh, construction or either pre-stressed concrete um, uh, and uh, these, um, uh, these materials actually did show to be um, quite uh, durable and and also to give a particular um, um, landmark appearance to these housing estates. Uh, so, for instance, the combination of the facade brick and prefabricated concrete um, uh, facade elements became a kind of uh, usual uh, method to apply uh, to um, housing construction during this uh, uh, time period. And then you can also see, see in some cases the, uh, it, uh, the, the architect's intention to um, uh, try and introduce the nature and the gro uh, ground floor um, um, ambiences into the, into the building. So now I will focus on the two case studies, not on Boer and Subotica, just the Belgrade case studies, uh, as the seminar says. And as I understood the, the first one you visited yesterday, and then the second one, Zerak Vineyards, you will actually be able to see uh, later on during the day uh, a short excerpt from an uh, interview uh, with the architect of this housing estate. So it might be interesting to listen to her and actually see from first hand uh, what, were, what were the intentions of the uh, uh, authors. Uh, as I mentioned, you can see here that uh, the new Belgrade had a completely different urban logic um, uh, uh, th that was already pre-designed by the, uh, by the um, architects the, uh, who did the urban plan for new Belgrade. And then the second one was much more uh, freely designed in accordance to the top topography and the surroundings. Um, so bo both of these uh, case studies, um, the investors were uh, was the Yugoslav People's Army, um, and this also indicates the other uh, 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 profiler of this um, of this project, which is middle class. So uh, Yugoslav People's Army was considered to be one of the. Uh, uh, richest branches of the state that got a lot of uh, budgetary uh, um, 
uh, subsidies uh, and they were invested, uh, investing a lot of these into the housing construction. Uh, so here you can see only a part of the housing construction that was provided by the Yugoslav People's Army um, based on several uh, sources. This is definitely not the entire construction they did. It is far larger, but in this uh, time period, uh, it is very indicative to see how, uh, how involved they were and how much housing they actually provided. Not all of the housing was actually intended to, for the members of the uh, army, but they were the providers. Uh, and you can see that uh, Belgrade uh, had a very large uh, um, uh, role in this in this housing construction. And so these are the models from the Block 23 and Serac Vineyards. Again, you can see the different uh, uh, conditions of the surroundings that uh, that implied the architectural design. So these are uh, some of the, um, the drawings um, that were ongoing during the design uh, by the architects uh, uh, trying to uh, find the best solution for um, uh, creating the inner space of the block and creating um, uh, um, pedestrian uh, walkways um, and the different uh, kinds of uh, ambiances within the open block. So these are um, the, um, let's say, typical floor plans of uh, uh, some of the apartment uh, units within uh, Block 23 and Cerak. Uh, as Maria mentioned before, um, this is very much connected to the idea of the uh, Belgrade uh, School of Housing, uh, which was proposed as a possible concept uh, during the 70s by some architects who participated within this uh, design process. Um, and uh, some of the key motives of this Belgrade School of, uh, of Housing uh, was this extend, uh, extended communication was probably the most prominent. And this is the area where the dining uh, table would be located most commonly uh, since the since the uh, technical norms for designing the apartments didn't really allow to have uh, separate that many separate rooms the um, the surface of every separate room had a maximum um, uh, surface allowed uh, so the architects kind, uh, kind of found um, a new way of, of uh, designing designing area without designing an additional room and this also became a centerpiece of the apartment um, uh, around which you could actually um, circulate throughout the apartment and you could you the families would actually use this area throughout their everyday practices for all sorts of things, not only uh, as uh, uh, for dining, as it was uh, designed for, but also for um, family gatherings, friend gatherings, so sometimes even work and so on, which again, there will be another film with the student workshop um, um, projections later on during the day. One of the films is actually centered around this uh, motive, so you can learn a bit more about it if you're interested. Um, and then also you can see in Sairak the uh, really um, um, uh, important thing for the architects. So it was uh, the, the mitigation of the inner outer space boundary between the apartment and the surroundings. Um, um, so, and these, these two projects and these apartments are very, um, 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 really true examples very exemplary of of the of the of the belgrade school uh, school of housing so from extended communication to extended design what is really interesting about these two case studies is that the architects remained involved uh, in the life of the buildings and the housing districts even after the construction was initially finished so in the first uh, example, in the Block 23, um, what happened is that during the 80s, um, the idea of extending uh, the buildings uh, appeared within the army because they 
came to a conclusion it would be cheaper for them to already use the infrastructure they have to um, 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 enlarge the number of uh, dwelling units instead of actually building new uh, housing estates. So they would use the flat rooftops of the modernistic uh, housing buildings to do, uh, do these kind of extensions. And so in 1987, uh, one of the original architects, Alexander Stepanovich, did lead the team that designed the uh, rooftop extension uh, of two of the buildings within the block, which are the largest. And you can see what is marked here. These are, these are all new dwelling units that were um, additionally built during the 90s. Um, since they were built during the 90s, the time that Yugoslavia uh, dis disintegrated and a lot of uh, people came from other republics, um, uh, the residents currently actually uh, do believe that they were spontaneously built, that this was not the army's original intention, uh, and actually perceive these roof rooftop ex extensions as a, some kind of informal or sometimes even uh, illegal interventions done by the residents that were coming from other republics, um, which is not true. <laughs> uh, and then in the second case, you can see the original drawing uh, uh, by, by the architects uh, uh, Milenia and Darko Marošić, who designed the um, uh, Cerek along with Nedeljko Borovnica. Uh, they actually remained on site for a very long time, a uh, long period of years, providing uh, advice for the residents how to rearrange or change their ap apartments according to their needs. Uh, so they invested a lot of time in um, trying in first place to actually help these residents to uh, use full uh, capacities of the of the apartments and then uh, in second place they actually tried to um, preserve the original values and architectural appearance of these buildings by aiding the residents to do these alterations uh, in a manner that wouldn't uh, degrade the, the, the housing estate. But <laughs> as you can see, uh, these uh, alterations and changes are uh, done by the residents themselves are kind of unavoidable in this context. And so here you can actually see uh, in block 23, um, the planned extension, which is covered in this corrugated uh, uh, metal sheets, completely different materialization uh, from the original concrete, prefabricated concrete of the block 23. Uh, and then next to it, you can actually see another roof extension uh, that was done by the resident uh, informally. You, you will see on a larger um, frame later on. Um, and then in Cerak uh, vineyards, you always have, especially in the ground floor apartments and uh, the, the, some of the um, uh, commercial units that were abandoned, um, uh, a lot of different uh, informal uh, alterations. And here on a larger scale, you can actually see these, um, uh, these um, so this is the formal in between these um, vertical accents, which are duplex apartments. In between, you can see the rooftop extension, which was formally done, planned by the army and designed by the original architect. But then in between, if you can see like this, the informal uh alterations have been done because the uh, the residents of the duplex apartments realized that this is a perfect opportunity for them to kind of grab a little bit more space for them and then extend their apartments to the rest of the um, uh, um, rooftop terraces uh, so these this building and this one are the same and these are the ones that actually had uh, the rooftop extensions while the mid-rise uh, slabs didn't have the rooftop extensions and then the residents didn't uh, either do the informal ones themselves uh, because they didn't have these vertical accents with duplex apartments and so this flat roof kind of uh, remained as as it was designed originally here uh, on Cerak vineyard uh, photos um, what in the lower photo where you can see that this kind of rooftop extension became a kind of regular practice throughout the 90s and the 2000s in Belgrade and probably wider uh, because here this is another um, uh, housing estate uh, Vidikovac within Knežavo Kijevo uh, project it is just south from Cerak vineyards 
And you can see all of these rooftops that resemble kind of mushrooms were completely informally done by the residents. Uh, the high rise buildings were designed with flat rooftops and the residents kind of picked up on the uh, general practice of these extensions uh, and uh, started uh, extending their own apartments or building completely new apartments on top of these uh, uh, towers. And then you can see the the Tzerak vineyards, which actually remains quite uh, untacked, uh, not degraded, and it is the only spatial um, landmark that uh, enjoys uh, uh, the status of um, uh, uh, protection as a cultural and historic heritage. So the architects that actually stayed involved for years within the neighborhood perhaps did contribute with their um, uh, fight and their desire to preserve this uh, this this neighborhood and to um, and for for the neighborhood to actually have this kind of status today in Serbia, which is again the only one that has this this kind of uh, this kind of. Um, Mm, landmark uh, notion. So that would be it for for today for these uh, four case studies. If I missed something, I apologize. Uh, again, you will see the interview with one of the ar original architects of this um, case study, which will tell you even more um, of their intentions. And then block 23, if you have any further questions, I will be happy to answer later. Okay. So, hello to everyone. Um, I'm very glad for being here. I hope you can hear me well, um, even this online, so we can share thoughts and arguments. If everything is well, maybe I can start presenting and um, telling one story, which is a sort of uh, micro history of how citizenship can contribute to building an apartment by participating in the prefabrication process. So for this, I will bring oral histories of protagonists that reflected uh, larger concerns of what we know as a societal modernization. So I will start from a particular apartment uh, built as part of experimental housing in New Belgrade and inhabited during the 60s by the family of uh, Mirjana Obradovic. At the moment, uh, she was a newborn child and nowadays she stands in front of the historical archives of Belgrade. About her growing up, she recalls, I quote, my parents moved into their new flat in spring 65. We children would gather around the sculpture of a polar bear made and placed in the middle of the block by the father of a school friend who was a stone mason. The inner courtyard was large and filled with playgrounds and benches and pines, chestnuts and birches trees. The school and kindergarten were part of it and had no fences. Almost all inhabitants gathered in the yard. There was a community center that we called the Fontaine with grocery store, chemist, post office, florist and restaurant on the ground floor. On the first floor was a hall where residents could meet. I used to go there with my mother to the women's evening where women from public life talked to residents on particular topics. The buildings were quite neutral, not too big, flats not too big, three rooms at most. What I remember was lots of sun and light, big windows through which you could see leaves, rain and snow. There was a room for celebrations and birthdays and the whole entrance had a lot of glass and atriums. We grew plants until eventually became a greenhouse. Roma brass bands regularly played in the atriums and we could throw them coins from the windows of our flats above. 
The top floor housed washrooms where we often played next to our parents. The area was surrounded by the construction site for a long time. The sand was full of pools with fish and ducks. We played hide and seek in the infrastructure pipes that laid around for years. End of quote. So the flat where she was growing up uh, was part uh, of the first housing in New Belgrade built in order to establish a modern district and a new way of making. It was a settlement uh, where uh, emerging Yugoslavian prefabricated system EMS was first applied. The system grew up on the culture of voluntarily youth work actions organized during the late 40s and early 50s as the only way to initiate the building of the new city in a country with a poor technological base. One of participants and afterwards professor at the Faculty of Philosophy wrote about the construction site. So I quote again, our student brigade uh, from the Faculty of Philosophy went to New Belgrade construction site in June 49. We were assigned to help construction workers on concrete reinforcement. There were two types of systems, Avramenko and the so-called P system. We soon started to produce construction elements by ourselves. The engineer in charge was Branko Zezel, who for the first time was testing the new method of prefabrication. So photographs documenting work actions were sent by Yugoslav Ministry of Construction in Tueteh in Zurich to Mir Korosh, who was a long lasting professor and head of the ETH Institute for Testing Materials. Roche was asked to spend his retirement years in Belgrade, the city of his childhood, in order to help dissolve the Ministry of Construction, according to the principles of self-governance, into, into a new institute for testing materials. Roche, who worked in line with Fresine, Maniel, and Mayart, enabled the transfer of knowledge on concrete to Yugoslavia, as well as the transfer of Swiss technology AMSLA. With these machines played in the former stamped factory, the new institute was created in order to find the material solution for large-scale migrations from province to cities. Institute response to this was the invention of the open system that aimed to be ultimately cheap and simple so it can fit any workforce and any urban and architectural scheme. About its emergence uh, in the albums produced in the Institute Concrete Department, it was explained that the lightweight construction was the first aim as the flood plains where the housing was built called for removal of surplus weight. This led to minimal construction consisted of only columns and floor slabs, which was quite unique um, compared to international prefabricated systems that were mainly based on walls. So its main quality was the clever join of the slab and column regulated by pre-stressed steel wires. Due to various possible degrees of reinforcement, the system offered flexibility of spans. The slab also contained the final solution for the ceiling and due to the absence of beam and integration of the ceiling, the structure formed a very clean base for further work. The production of floor slabs was also very simple using paper instead of steel molds. So the solution finally achieved the aim while it weighted 30% less than any known system of prefabrication worldly and actually made it possible to build on sand. As uh, 1960 uh, album shows, uh, the structure was constructed by a range of builders from laymen and semi-skilled workers to engineers. So what participants uh, did on the site was retroactively returned to the plan. The plan's author, who was Branko Petricic, wrote that in order to meet the vision of the EMS, um, quote, we adopted a span of 4.2 meters and as well as a new urban vision, we came up with an original structural system. It seems that extremely difficult site conditions were crucial to this. End of quote. So the solution brought the relief to housing sector as by the late 
1960s, many of further buildings in New Belgrade had been designed and built using the EMS system. So the experience of uh, experimental site was taken as a kind of discovery uh, for a further development. To work on this, uh, a new department was set up um, known as the Buildings Department or Zgradarstvo, which was to study the compatibility of system and flats in emerging uh, residential buildings. Eventually, uh, the department evolved into a more specialized uh, center for housing, which further promoted the idea, the idea of the open system by researching uh, how a flat can become a dynamic surface for a fictive inhabitant. So Xenia Petovar, who worked at the center as sociologist, explained that their main concern was to deal with these huge buildings meant to last for at least 100 years. So there was nothing temporary about them, while the way of inhabiting was to change at least three times with each new generation. The attempt to assure a level of flexibility was done through the production of diagrams that paralleled the design of flats. So one named human needs and functions of a flat was done a couple of years before a much more famous diagram that you see on the right side, made by Cedric Price and called Generator. Both expressed the preoccupation of the era of 70s with social surveys and aimed to offer a script according to, according to which a flat could constantly reinvent itself according to the needs of a person. So analysis like this helped to end up with apartments like that, that had no hardcore division, but only fragmented corners that corresponded to the pillars of the system. The further development of participation was achieved by the transfer of Yugoslavian system internationally, uh, led by the channels of non-aligned movement. EMS started to export to very different ends, with Cuba being one of its new destinations. So Cuba was an interesting new home because the societal modernization there relied on extensive inclusion of laymen work. In the years following the Cuban revolution from 1959, the country that was initially associated with casino culture, colonial architecture, and the very vernacular type of house known as Bohio underwent large-scale housing reform. This was to be performed by microbrigada, uh, which were unions of workers in the need of a flat that formed a group and instead of a company worked at a construction site, so using land and material provided by the state. For the scale of the housing reform, local Sandino construction system was not enough and Cuba was searching for adequate means internationally. This meant that experimental buildings became a key concept again in order to handle modernization. So well-known, worldly prefabricated systems were selected and tested in Cuba by assigning to each experimental site. EMS was one of the competing systems that aimed to give answer to the government on which one works best with the unskilled works workforce of microbrigades. So the location that was assigned uh, uh, to EMS building was the, the, in the center of Havana, in the new district called Micro Distrito, at Cuban enormous public square, Plaza de, Revo de, la, de la Revolucion. So contracts between the Institute and uh, the Cuban Ministry of Construction were arranged so that regular trainings of Cuban craftsmen at the new Belgrade site were going on and vice versa. EMS so-called field engineers spent years uh, on a sort of mission in learning local people how to use prefabrication in order to achieve flat. Branimir Grujic, uh, who was one of them, uh, explained how that this transfer of not only the system, but before all the social vision was settled in Cuban context. So I quote, the builders apart from two qualified craftspeople had never worked in construction and though very young, they completed their training. Then those who had passed the trainings 
course built the primary structure and micro brigades worked on other aspects. So end of quote. Modernism was gradually accepted, um, and this was evident in exchange of letters such as one written by Jose Cordero, who was one among craftspeople trained in Belgrade. I quote, do not think that the delay in writing to you is because I have forgotten you. It's because I left writing for, the, for when we finished the first building so that you could see that your effort in teaching us the EMS system has been crowned with total success. Soon we will start a building of 126 meters long that with the experience of obtained from the first will without a doubt be much better." End of quote. The aim of um, the long building referred to in uh, Cordero's letter was to test joints that if successful would make it possible to vary the length and shape of housing. And finally, the third experimental housing known as a quote, told building, end of quote, options for the high rise were also resolved. So testing of uh, CM4 functional city um, features such as concrete prefabrication, long slab building, tower, open block, went on until 71 when the Cuban administration adopted the EMS system as being more competitive than other prefabrication systems. So afterwards, this spread over in construction of housing, not only in Havana, but throughout the province. Factories for, for production of flats called uh, Plantas de Vivienda Yugoslavia Cuba were established with locals working there, Branko Zezze uh, gave interviews for Cuban newspapers. University of Havana established institutes similar as uh, EMS. Conferences were held and the emergence of the EMS system in Cuba affected the everyday lives of those who were doing the building. So Cuban journalist Reinaldo Escobar uh, wrote, worked for five years on the construction of the EMS building. It was a Yugoslavian model called the MS-14 with 14 floors constructed as part of extended work around initial experimental site. Before joining the construction, Escobar had an established career as journalist for the well-known magazine Cuba Internacional, a monthly publication on quality paper with magnificent photos and carefully edited text to reflect the success of the revolutionary project internationally. So his micro brigade came from the Cuban Institute of Radio and Television. Escobar's participation was driven by his desire to obtain a home. One, um, I quote, where he would grow plants, raise a dog and listen to music and where he would have a very special corner with his dictionaries and his typewriter to devote himself to writing, not just journalistic articles, but above all writing for himself and perhaps one day write a novel, just one, in which he could tell of his life and his reflections on the epoch and the country." End of quote. So on his return to work, when the construction of the EMS building was completed, Escobar decided to write the novel that he called uh, La Grieta, meaning the crack um, in Spanish. So there he narrates himself in the third person, becoming a young man eager to be a man of the cows, who ends up being considered as enemy of the revolution. In the fragment from this novel, Escobar recounts his experiences in construction of a Yugoslavian building. Quote, his first job after returning to work as an editor was a an extensive report on housing construction. His experiences as a member of the micro brigade were still fresh in his mind, as was the excitement of opening the door of his flat for the first time. As he drafted the text, he discovered that he had enough material to write a novel. He would not be satisfied with a purely autobiographical narrative, but could attempt a parallel between the construction of the building and the task of building a new society. To capture the reader's interest, he would elaborate a plot which he called Catching the Criminal of the Novel. 
His protagonist would discover that the building, whose structure was already 14 stories high, was sinking at one end. He would not get bogged down in technical details because any building could begin to sink for a hundred of reasons. The important thing would be to establish the dramatic scope which functioned as an allusion to the eventual collapse of the revolutionary project, to the fading of utopia. As a proof of the collapse, Reynaldo would show a crack repeated on each floor in the same wall. This detail gave him an eloquent title for his novel, rich in tragics and conflictive intuitions that led open the possibility of a possible solution or an irremediable disaster. So I will skip the major part here and come to the final scene where um, I quote Reynaldo lies down and put his bed back using his boots as a pillow. He looks up through the gap between the steps and continues. The hole where the window frame goes needs to be finished off. We'll have to put a pane of glass in it. Those panels of glass have to be brought in, cut, distributed, fitted. He closes his eyes and pronounces the final words of the novel. How much is still missing? End of quote. So the quote was uh, the part of the novel with, uh, which Reynaldo Escobar wrote on his typewriter and the one existing manuscript was confiscated by state security at Havana airport when Escobar tried to get it out of the country. So in 2080, 25 years later, he rewrote the novel from memory and got it published in a Spanish edition, which soon started to win prizes. Afterwards, with his partner and activist, Ioanni Sanchez, Escobar set up the first independent Cuban news platform, which they eventually called 14 and Medio, at the top floor of the EMS building type 14. That's their building. So Escobar's uh, participation in construction is particularly relevant as it highlights the position of the individual in relation to the framework of housing reform. His story about the identification of social prospect and the construction process takes the Yugoslav system as material for critical reflection in the course of its application. So here it was relevant to see how the system which was created at one part of the world to support the idea of apartment in, in socialism became means to question it in another. Initial reality of work actions seen as a huge responsiveness of people to build societal modernization was channeled and modified in a process that their technology was familiarized and their material even served as a subversive act to question things like housing right, the idea of socialism, the process of modernization. In this system, uh, we can say that the, 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 in this sense, we can say that the system was open enough as it was capable to hold eclectic and even contradictory realities. So its ability to help articulating resistance is what gives to this transfer of, of one idea of how to build uh, an apartment anthropological value. So thank you a lot. I hope you could hear me well. So I will now stop sharing and yeah, greetings.